Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Market Maker podcast. Um, good to be back after my, my week away. I did, I did listen in, uh, Piers, so I did hear the, um, the jibes. But yeah. also, yeah, you know, look, I always, always deliver on a bit of market volatility while I'm away. So yeah, can you explain <laughs> or, or, well, are you even going to bother defending yourself or, or are you just going to let it hang? I mean, are, are you responsible for, you know, global disorder spiking whenever you sort of step away from the desk? Well, well yeah, I mean, look, the, for, I know you talked about this as well last week, but it's definitely true. I remember many times in my career prior to when I, when I joined Amplify, when I was running a desk and I, you would sit there for hours, right? You'd sit there for 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day, watching markets to the point where I didn't even want to go to the toilet. I didn't even want to yeah. eat. H- hence, hence my corned beef sandwiches that I come in wrapped in tinfoil still to this day that you always have a problem with. Um, but the, the point being is that people like yourselves who are trading, you didn't give us a pass. We're the ones who had to watch the headlines all day long, right? That's, how, that's what we were paid for as our job. And I do remember distinctly one time when I'd sat there from 6 a.m. till 12, not a break, nothing. I went for a 30 seconds. I ran to the toilet. And within those 30 seconds, I remember uh, the People's Bank of China cut rates. And I was like, I've been, cut, wait, yeah. wait, I've been waiting for it <laughs> for like six <laughs> hours. I go for 30 seconds and, and that's what happens. But that is one of a number of events that I can I can think of over the years. But. That's right. It's like, like trading as well. I remember back in the day on the trading floor, you would, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like we were short-term, looking to exploit short-term volatility. So, so obviously, uh, yeah, you know, there's certain stuff that you know is going to happen. It's scheduled. So like economic data, right? So you, you know it's happening at 1.30 p.m. or whatever, 9 a.m. or so, right, fine, you're going to be at your desk, done. But then obviously there's the unscheduled stuff where, you know, you don't know when it's coming and, and it's kind of sod's law that, you know, something kind of dramatic happens and, yeah, you happen to be, um, you know, using the, the little boy's room or something. So, yeah, we, we used to sit there and, well, I remember, and, and actually not only missing stuff, it was also if you're in a trade, then, you know, you, would, you didn't want to leave your desk because, well, you're in a trade, right? And you've got risk on and you're, you're trying to manage that risk. And oh God, I remember a few times people, other traders, basically, because, I, you know, if I wasn't in a trade at that point, they would kind of basically persuade me to babysit their trade whilst they then sprint down the aisle, like down the kind of big central aisle of the big trading floor, literally sprint down to the toilet at the end, smash into the toilet, do what they're going to do, and then sprint back, um, you know, trying to try to do that in about 30 seconds, as you say, just so they can get back and like, whew, all right, yeah, nothing happened. It's, it's fine. And um, But yeah, there's nothing worse as a trader missing, not being at your desk when something kicks off. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the, the one, the most extreme um story that i have was through a combination of what i thought was trying to be as good as i could at my job mixed in with a healthy dose of fear of reprisal if i missed something i remember one time i was on my own the others had all gone out and i really needed the toilet <laughs> and like the proper toilet so i thought we're talking number two here talking oh. number twos and so i thought you know what no, you know, you know when you get a dustbin, it has like the plastic <laughs> bag in it, right, with the cover <laughs> over the edge. I yeah, <laughs> pulled over, pulled over the bin. I'm I'm in in a pro- professional office here. Pulled <laughs> over a bin, started undoing my trousers, got my trousers halfway down my ankles, and then someone walked back in. And just, just what the hell are you doing? <laughs> uh, Actually, I got I got I got kudos for that. Back yeah, well, it's dedication to, to yeah. the cause. Yeah, right? I was ready to drop one, literally, for the team to stay to stay on, <laughs> on, the, on the call, on the ball for you guys. That's how far it goes. Well, that's why you're the, the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say I'm the best. First off, to kick this episode off, I've had, a, I've had a couple of people call me out 
for my inappropriate call on Russia. And I hold my hands up. I got it wrong. Definitely got it wrong. I definitely did not think that Putin would do what he's done. Definitely not to the level uh, of aggression. Uh, I don't think I'm the only one who, <laughs> who, who thought that. Uh, but certainly, for sure, um, I got it wrong. So, so hands up to that first. Uh, secondly, yeah. before we go into the, the nuts and bolts of what we're going to cover in, in this conversation, we're going to talk about Russia. There's various different parts of this to update you on, which I want to go through and obviously get your opinion, Piers. Then we're going to talk about commodities um, surging across the board, everything at the moment, whether it's soft oil, energy, um, everything is moving higher right now. And I want to get your your um, kind of view about what does this mean going further forward for not just Fed policy, but risks of recession, stagflation, those types of things. And then we're going to finish off. There's been a ruling in America about TikTok. And so not all Russia. I know it's hard to find any other stories to talk about at the moment, but we'll also talk about that at the end as well. But last thing was... Um, I did release the latest career insight conversation on the previous podcast on Wednesday of this week. And I chatted to a guy called Bilal Hafiz. If you've never heard of him, he's only the former global head of research at Nomura and Deutsche Bank and was an advisor to the CEO of Deutsche Bank for 20 years. So yeah, he's, he's super experienced and super humble and super honest. And he gives a really great um, insight as to working in an investment bank because he actually started an IBD and then he switched into global markets and research. So yeah, he gives a really good take. He talks about some general advice, tips, things like that. So if you're a student looking to get into finance, 100% recommend go back, check that out. But yeah, let's let's kick it off and let's talk, let's talk Russia. So I'm conscious of the fact that I've got the news feed up beside me here at the moment while we're talking just to keep a half an eye on it because it's it's moving that fast <laughs> in terms of the headlines because you you pinged me a message earlier saying iran nuclear deal and i was like no 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 you must have been to the toilet because <laughs> you, <just, laughs> you just missed the headlines the source has just come out and said no that's not the case so this right. is the nature of the the day trading environment right now um also we've just had a report Again, very hard to see, pick through the noise here, but there was apparently a phone call according to AFP, the French news agency, that Putin is aiming to seize the whole of Ukraine. That was according to a conversation on a telephone call with uh, French President Macron uh, just a few hours ago. But this comes in the context of Russia. They're claiming to have captured the port city of, of Kherson in the southern part of Ukraine. So at the moment, they're making good headway there. But geographically, would kind of make sense from the sense of coming out for Crimea and that southern region where they've already they're kind of well equipped uh, militarily. In the north, though, there does seem to be a degree of perhaps miscalculation on the Russian side over the resistance from Kiev in the in the capital. But most strategist reports that I have read since that over the last twenty four hours would suggest that they're regrouping and they will come again. Uh, more forcefully. So it seems like the clock is ticking there at the moment. This comes as they've had conversations. There's been a second round of talks between Ukraine and Russia. Haven't really seen the outcome of those come through just yet. We're recording this on Thursday, the 3rd of, Mar of March. Um, but I'd say the way to assess any of these conversations between Ukraine and Russia directly at the moment is one of relief. And that is just based on if they... Uh, agree to continue talking. We're not talking about some kind of solution this early. There's no way that's going to happen right now. But just a commitment to keep the door open could well be favorable for, for asset prices. The opposite, of course, is complete breakdown. And we get kind of continuation of a lot of the things that, that we've seen. So there's hopes uh, of uh, an outcome of those are very low, I, I would say, at this point. The other things are US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, He's kind of rallying the troops in Eastern Europe, just making sure that Team NATO is all on board. Um, so as you would probably expect. Um, some other things that have been going on that are probably worth mentioning. The US is postponing what they call the Minuteman 3. Have you heard of that? Uh, not until today, no. <laughs> it's the Intercontinental Ballistic 
missile test. <laughs> they had it planned for this week. And it sounds, sounds pretty frightening, just the words intercontinental ballistic missile, but yeah, Iran do it. Well, um, yeah. Everyone does it. North Korea, North Korea does it. China does it. it. Right. North Korea doesn't mind uh, a missile test every now and then. But I guess here's quite an interesting point. Obviously, if North Korea have a missile test, hmm. then the Western press goes, oh, my God, it's the big risk. You know, this guy can't be trusted. You know, are we in range of his missiles? And But obviously, we're testing missiles all the time as well. Right. But And I mean, we hold proportionately a yeah. phenomenally outnumbering every other country on planet is the US, which yeah. then they get upset about another country holding a handful. I, I honestly think this is the very, very, very first time I've heard in the media about the West, like the US or the UK or anyone in the West, testing a missile and, and maybe not testing a missile because of geopolitical reasons. First time ever. Yeah. Well, look, don't don't get don't get me started on my personal views on this. I've been in a, I've had my hand slapped already online for for giving away too many of my own feelings on these things. But no, I think I think you're you're right. And obviously the the US tactically are, are just trying to calm the situation because of the the raised status of which Putin had said before. And I commented on this in a session earlier today about the kind of what we call saber rattling. Which is kind of what Korea does, which is, yes, they are test firing these missiles, but it's the rhetoric and the rhetoric of using the threat of escalation like Putin has done with the nuclear alert level is not uncommon. Um, this yes. is, is, is the main point. So the other things then are Russia's rating was cut to junk by Moody's. Fitch also slashed it by six levels to junk. <laughs> Uh, and MSCI has eliminated Russian equities from its EM index. So just wanted to get your take on what does that what does that really mean? What does junk status mean? And also, why is that important for, for fund managers, portfolio managers, when we see um, the EM index being changed in that way? Yeah, so this, this is actually, it's, it's kind of a, it's like a, it's like a sanction in a way, because, um, so if we look at bonds, Okay, so uh, Russian government bonds, right? They, and any any kind of any any bond that generally has a rating, and this is where one of the what's called the one of the independent credit rating agencies, and there's loads of rating agencies, but there, there's three giant ones that really cover the world's you know top level kind of bonds. So it's S and P, Moody's, and Fitch. Okay, these are the big three. Um, and then look, it's their job to assess the credit worthiness of the borrower and assign a rating to that borrower depending on their credit worthiness. And they tend to review these borrowers from time to time. And if their economic situation shifts and changes, well, then fine, the rating agency then may well change that rating accordingly, right? Um, and you have rated like AAA, you'll have heard of, that's the top notch, okay? That's the safest, that's like where the borrower is the most credit worthy, okay? Um, and actually, since the financial crisis, just as a, as a slight aside, since 2008, um, we had a load of downgrades going on as, you know, the global economic environment went majorly south and debt levels went majorly up. And um, and, and so actually, we're, we do live in an age where there just aren't many triple A rated uh, bonds anymore. And this does make it tricky for investors who want to who, who have an investment strategy that's, that's very low risk, you know, it's very difficult when there aren't many low risk assets left. And so actually they're forced into taking more risk. Just And I'm talking about like big pension funds here would be a good example. So big giant pension funds would tend to have low risk income bearing strategies, um, but they're having to take more risk now just because there isn't enough kind of Triple A rated stuff out there. Anyway, that's a, that's an aside, right? So triple A, and then it goes like double A, single A, and then it goes into the Bs, triple B, double B, single B, and you you got pluses and minuses in here as well. So for example, in the double in the triple Bs, you got triple B plus, triple B, triple B minus, and then you go double B plus, double B, double B minus, and so on, right? But basically, you got triple A down to triple C, or sometimes D. 
and B is default. Okay, so AAA, super safe, the likes of Germany, for example, German government bonds, and then D is default, right? Um, halfway down the range, the top half of the range is called uh, investment grade. So if you're triple B minus rated or higher, then you're what's called investment grade. Okay. If you go below triple B, so if you go from triple B minus down to double B plus, that triple B to double B line is your move from investment grade to non-investment grade. And non-investment grade, the nickname for that is junk. So everyone, I'm sure, will have heard of this, this idea of junk bonds. Well, they don't mean they're rubbish, you know, worthless, throw them in the bin. It just it's a reflection of the fact that the creditworthiness of the borrower has has dropped below investment grade. Now, the point here is when you get rating changes like Fitch have just, what did you say? Five notches down. Six it, notches. Six. I, I think that's it's got to be one of the biggest ratings changes I've ever seen. Um, anyway, the point here is if they take them into non-investment grade, then um, certain funds um, have a risk constraint where they're not allowed to have any non-investment grade assets in their portfolios. So if an asset gets changed from investment grade to non-investment grade, they're forced to sell it. And so this is kind of the idea here. Uh, on the bond side with the credit rating change, it's basically forcing funds to sell Russian bonds. And then that, that big wave of selling actually makes matters even worse because um, then the price of this debt drops and the, and the yields rifle higher and it's a bit of a vicious cycle actually now on the msci world index side it's it's similar but but different right there's a lot of index trackers out there that's um equity funds that track indices and so their job is to track that index as closely as they can and the way they do that is that in their etf they'll have all of the shares that are in the index that they're tracking. But if the index decides, right, we're going to take some of these shares out, well, then these ETFs have to sell those shares. So if you take out Russian equities from the MSCI index, then it forces certain ETFs to sell those shares. And again, that drives the price down, exacerbating the problem. So it's like a sanction. It's like a clever kind of financial market sanction, if you like. Yeah, to give that a real world overlay, I was just pulling up an article I was reading last night where US asset managers like Capital Group, BlackRock, yeah. Vanguard disclosed large exposures when their last filings. So going back to that last time that was, which was the period starting Sept 21 through to Feb 25th of this year, it's not that long ago, they total over 60 billion US of Russian. Dollars. $60 billion when considering the top 100 open-end funds and exchange-traded funds worldwide in terms of estimated US dollar exposure to Russian securities. Right. Yeah. So big, big names here on that list. The top 10 funds, Invesco, developing fund, market fund, 3.6 billion in equities, PIMCO income fund, same size, Vanguard, same size, uh, another PIMCO one's on there. Goldman's uh, GQC Partner International. They have another fund, 1.72 billion in equities. Where's, where's BlackRock? Equity. Where's BlackRock on that list then? So, don't BlackRock, 264 million, but right. around 5 billion when including okay. their iShares ETFs in equity and fixed income. Right. Okay. I was going to say, because BlackRock are the biggest. Like assets under management, they're, they're kind of up to almost like 10 trillion or something crazy. And so uh, I was surprised when you weren't saying BlackRock there, and certainly <laughs> they're kind of iShares and their ETFs there, they're kind of giants. Maybe, so, maybe BlackRock have got a deal with uh, Reuters and uh, yeah. it, just just tuck it in there. It, it's, it's, it's public information, but don't, don't shout about it. Um, but yeah, in terms of Spurbank, the country's number two, um, bank they they got cut off from swift and i know in the last podcast episode that was what you and will were talking about as in the next level of major escalation would have been swift and i think it was saturday that they did that yeah um, so they've been hit by the full blocking of sanctions from the us and a um, bit of context there so vtb and Spurbank, the two big ones the state controls 92 percent of vtb and 50 percent percent of Spurbank. 
uh, and Spurbank were down in terms of London traded Russian companies. They're all down about nearly basically 100 percent. Yeah. They've all died almost. Spurbank's down 99 percent. Gazprom's down 98 um, yeah. percent for the numbers. So, yeah, so of... it'd be interesting to see how some of these funds fare. Um, they've had a pretty rough time, really, uh, in many different ways, trying to call the shots over the whole COVID situation. Um, then with the switch of the Fed, catching people a little off guard as well, the positioning with the yield movement we were talking about a few months ago. Now you've got this Russian situation. It's been a tough one. Uh, it's been a tough time. one. I mean, I guess like in any, you know, super volatile period, it's really hard. But I mean, there's huge opportunity out there it, if you can if you can kind of just get get it right and oh, it's timing it, isn't it? It's timing it right. That's the key. It's all in the timing. But obviously, whilst there's huge opportunity, of course, there's I mean, there's massive pain being reaped out across the, the asset space because, yeah, you, if you're on the wrong side of these and you're not dealing with that, then, yeah, it can get, it can get pretty ugly. Uh, and actually, you know, I guess a lot of listeners, you know, I imagine have been, let's say, crypto is, is obviously a very popular asset class. Um, and, you know, it, that, it's been a huge kind of volatile period and a huge period of downside for a lot of these coins and it's just tough it's tough to deal with it um gotta have diamond hands pierce this is it yep hoddle <laughs> <laughs> Cle what clen hoddle <laughs> hold hold everything will be okay is the uh <laughs> Uh, the, the Wall Street. Yeah, I was talking. Uh, I was actually uh, at, um, showing your age now. <laughs> I was running. Yeah, I was running an event uh, at university yesterday, actually, and um, talking to a guy who, who's a crypto trader. And I was saying, yeah, you know, how, you know, have you? How's it been over the last couple of months? Because obviously, there's been some serious downside. And he goes, oh yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's it's fine. It's actually almost fully rebounded now. And I, I said, what? Sorry. What, I'm not quite sure what charts you're looking at, but he said, oh, well, you know, it's nearly rebounded. And I said, all right, let's have a look at a chart then. <laughs> I pulled up the chart. It's like, I don't know, it's bounced in the last couple of days. Mm. I don't know, maybe 10, 15% of the full sell-off. Yeah. And in his mind, because it's, uh, it's so interesting, the psychology behind that, he, he now thinks, right, it's, it's all gone back. Back to the highs, almost. So, well, look, let know. me let me add a bit of flavor to that. So, we peaked in Bitcoin. I'm looking at futures just because I have futures charts up all the time. So, forgive me for anyone who's looking at the actual price of Bitcoin. Looking at futures. So, we peaked 10th of November. We were trading up at 69, just short of 70,000. We hit the low in the end of January of this year. It was down 52 percent from that high. The, the rally that your man's talking about <laughs> is from basically the last week. We've gone, we're up about 30%. Yeah, off the low, yeah. Off yeah. the low, correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've right. recouped, I mean, if you look at it, um, you know, we've recouped about just over a quarter of the move on the sell-off from what yeah. we had. Ba basically, if you want to put it in monetary terms, it's sold off. $32,000, the price dropped by $32,000. Yeah. And it's bounced by not seven, eight or 9,000. So we dropped 32, it's bounced about eight or nine. Well, look, let's, let's not make it any worse for this chap because well, yeah. Bitcoin's already down another 1,500 bucks as we speak. So yeah. <laughs> well, there's a really important, like anything around like that 45,000, 44, 45,000 handles, really key for resist technical resistance on Bitcoin. That was the kind of off the, that initial kind of January low where we tested 35,000, big banks to, I mean, it wasn't quite 45, but almost. And that, that's really been a topside barrier. We tested that yesterday and, and it's pulling back now. So it looks like that, that resistance area has just done its job and uh, push things back lower. But yeah, so technically, obviously, these cryptos are, are very, quite strongly influenced, more, more influenced by technicals, I'd say, than, than pretty much. Right, right. Some, of the, 
some of the talk earlier in the week, of course, was about because of all of the degree and, uh, and stringency of the sanctions in play, was looking at the inflow because of people trying to come out of rubles. Yeah. And, and then whether or not there was any play into that, into, into Bitcoin and other, other cryptos. So it did get a decent bounce two yeah. days ago. And it makes sense, right? I mean, you know, for, for, this is like the first, I don't know, major sort of economy that's who's seen their currency collapsing where the, well, I, hang on, now I'm saying this, obviously Turkey have been through this as well, but um, for obviously different reasons. But um, yeah, I mean, shifting your, your rubles into Bitcoin or whatever other crypto is the perfect hedge, right? And what I'm interested in is, why didn't crypto bounce when the invasion started for that reason? Why did the bounce in crypto happen five, six days into the invasion? So that doesn't quite marry together in my mind. The other, the other thing as well is that the, the French, I think, were talking two days ago and they were saying that they basically, in particular, cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, which should not be used to circumvent the financial sanctions decided upon by the 27 EU countries. I thought Bitcoin's not, <laughs> not supposed to be subject to this sort of thing. Well, that's a, that's a bit of a sound bite. It sounds like Macron doesn't quite understand. Well, it wasn't these. Macron. To, oh, to sorry, it wasn't it was, Macron. It was someone right. else. Yeah, it was one of his, his teammates. Yeah. Um, I think they've kind of misunderstood the whole thing there, haven't they? Well, yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, "Mm, EU to make sure Russia cannot circumvent sanctions with crypto assets. How do they do that? Maybe I'm missing Well, unless they can (laughs) seize crypto assets on, let's say, US-based crypto exchanges, or what if their wallets are based in the US, maybe? I I mean, I don't know. Yeah, and Coinbase actually has Coinbase, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. That would be it. Cool. Well, look, I mean... This is heading then towards the, the conversation of, of commodities because WTI crude futures have hit a high today of $116.5 per barrel. It's the highest level since 2008. We did have an OPEC plus meeting uh, yesterday and actually is one of the shortest ones in recent history. Um, I read that it lasts 13 minutes. Oh, wow. Really? Which is very uncommon because normally there's a lot of bartering and horse trading and so on to get to get an outcome. Uh, I guess some people might have been looking towards OPEC as to, you know, is there any deals that to be made for them to increase what has been the pattern of a slow, gradual 400,000 barrels coming back to market, which has been the kind of direction of travel for some time. Uh, and they didn't blink at all. Um, I guess without going too deep into it, there's just too many yeah. relationships to manage here for them to get any way interested in in moving that needle right and i yeah and also it's just too it's too much of a live situation where where so much can change so quickly that it's almost impossible to make kind of decisions on because like when you went late you know it's not like this is a tap like you've got in the kitchen right if you want to increase or decrease oil production levels then it's i know people often think well you just turn off the tap right well it's not quite as easy as that there's huge industrial production facilities that it's not quite switch on or switch off the switch it's so you know making a decision literally a few days into the conflict about your oil production levels over the next six months you know you can't really make decisions based on that. So I think the next OPEC meeting, because they do it monthly now, they never used to, right? It used to be only every six months, an OPEC meeting, but these days it's once per month. And so that's another reason why they didn't make any decisions here, because look, they got another one in four or five weeks, right? So, and, and by then, yeah, maybe things will be a bit clearer as to what this situation in the Ukraine might look like more on the medium term basis. And then fine, you can start to make decisions maybe better decisions based based on that. And, and a lot of this uh, commodity movement's not just isolated to energy. I know you were talking a couple of episodes ago, really, before all of this really kicked off about wheat and yeah. soft agricultural goods. And um, with, in terms of prices for wheat, it's gone past 11 bucks a bushel to the highest level in 14 years. 
So to recap, Ukraine, Russia ship more than a quarter of the world's wheat exports. So the fighting that's happening is closing ports, is holding up transportation, just basically a logistical nightmare to, to call it mildly of what it is at the moment. Um, one of the other interesting things I saw was some of the rationale as well about how aggr aggressively bid it's been is to do with the fact that there's kind of the knock-on effects because this isn't like oil, right? Where it's a physical hard commodity where the oil deposits are in the ground. And so you can just go into the ground and take it out, like whether it's rain, sun, shit, snow, whatever the case might be, right? But with a soft agricultural good, it follows a seasonal pattern. And so plantation and then, you know, harvesting your crop and so on. We're talking about the potential risk here of the shortages spilling over to next season beyond. Yeah. Because, um, and, and I think that implication actually, if anything, is, uh, is, is probably underplayed in to a certain respect. Well, and that's why the price has reacted more than, let's say, the price of oil. I mean, when we are talking about wheat as a commodity to watch for, as a really good barometer for this geopolitical situation. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. The, the price was below $8. Okay, it, it tested $12 today. So let's just call that a 50% rally. So oil has rallied, but oil's gone from $90 mm. to 115 right? So it, it's obviously not, that's less than a 50% rally. So wheat generally has gone up higher. And that and that's because, yeah, you're looking at this situation, not impacting, not only impacting supply in the short term, but possibly impacting supply, yeah, over the medium term. Um, so that just needs to get reflected in more. There's more supply risk for wheat over the medium term, which is why the price reaction has been much greater. And, and to put that into context, by the way, at $12, the last time wheat got above $12 was 2008, the start of January 2008. And that was only briefly. And that was the whole, I mean, that was a weird, phenomenal six months for general commodity markets. That was the six month period where oil hit $150. And we were all worried about peak oil and commodities were going crazy. And that was just before the financial crisis. Um, but other, you know, other than that, this is basically a record high for wheat prices, like ever. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's again, it's definitely. Um, you know, people are asking me now. I had a friend who was asking me yesterday about, look, should I buy wheat? And I'm like, uh, well, if you haven't bought it, <laughs> if you didn't buy it already, like a couple of weeks ago, then. I would suggest not buying it now. And that's just because when you have a 50% spike, well, then where do you go from there? Do you go higher still? And maybe, I don't know now, it's just really hard to call. And what definitely happens is the volatility level. Like you get price moves in both directions and the, the amplitude of that volatility massively increases. And so if you often, one of the classic mistakes of a trader is you miss that first big move and then you jump in because that FOMO, right? You, that fear of missing out, you think you, there's going to be another 50% move. It's fine. If I get in there, I, you know, I'll grab this move and it'll be great. I, I could probably oh. like hypothesize that 90% of our listeners did that with crypto. Well, <laughs> at uh, some point. Because, yeah. well, I hope that, you know, when they, they held, <laughs> <laughs> when, when it was... Um, because I know that you know that even even before the twenty break and it soared higher, you know there were well, Bitcoin been, twenty thousand, yeah, yeah. There's always been huge swings, yeah. And I know a lot of people shortly after when it had some wicked pullbacks. We got got some pain trades there, yeah, um, so absolutely. Yeah, just, to, just to manage accordingly, well, but but also what I mean maybe I wanted to just touch on the fact that you know we've been talking about sanctions, you know, governments issuing sanctions. But what's been really interesting to me is how markets have been almost self-sanctioning Russia. Like there's a couple of good examples. If you took oil, I mean, one of the reasons why oil is higher, obviously you just go, oh, well, it's supply risk, of course. And, and yes, that's true. But actually what's going, if you take, if you have a look at Russian oil, so that's, that's, that, that's basically, the, it's called the Urals crude. I mean, we often talk about WTI crude, which is the stuff that comes out of 
the Gulf of Mexico. So if you want to call it American crude or whatever, right? Or, or we talk about Brent crude, um, Rural's crude, or sorry, Ural's crude, um, doesn't often get much airtime. Um, but that right now is trading. So if you think oil's going up, well, Ural's crude isn't. That price has dropped by, it's now eight, it's trading at an $18 discount. Ural's crude is trading $18 per barrel lower than Brent crude. And you think, well, hang on, what? Why is that? And that's because no one wants to buy it. And actually, no one can buy it because to, to get this Ural's crude from Russia, well, obviously, there's transportation in the mix. And fine, there's various pipelines and all the rest of it, but a lot of it still gets shipped, right? And there's a huge amount of financing and insurance that, that goes into this process. And right now, the banks aren't prepared to issue lines of credit to insure shipments of Ural's crude coming from Russia. So actually, therefore, refineries, and it's the refineries, the big refineries in Europe, like Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Finland, Lithuania, Greece, Romania, Turkey, Bulgaria, these lot are the big buyers of Ural's crude. These are refineries, right? You get the crude, take it to a refinery, the refinery process then kind of cracks it out into its then component parts, which are then usable. Um, like petrol or, or gasoline or whatever, and paraffin and jet fuel and all this kind of sub, these are all subcomponents of crude oil, right? So the big refineries are buying Russian oil, but they're not anymore. So this stuff, they, they just can't sell it. And so I, know, actually, I know he's going to buy it. Go on. Abramovich. Now he's um, <laughs> got a bit of cash coming into the bank, apparently. The Chinese. The Chinese well, always, Iran has problems, get sanctioned. China buys it, discount, yeah. and so they they just stock it up like nobody's business, and they'll do this again with Russia. And although Putin has seemingly gone about his business, perhaps not informing China of his actions, which has probably caused a degree of disdain, particularly when there's some major political events to happen in China about the whole succession extended term of Xi Jinping. He does not yeah. want to be belittled on the international stage by small Vlad in his uh, probably opinion. And so there's a there's an easy way to fix that, which but is ch chip me China, some of that crude and then China have just come out though and uh for the first time seemingly yeah criticizing Putin and Russia's move into the Ukraine. I I I think well there's two parts of this. I think short term um they have to do that in terms of just making sure not so much the relationship with the west i don't think i don't think it's managing that i think it's managing putin to tell him right i mean it seems to me clear that china was not in the loop with the, a lot of the details on the timing and size of the scale of the invasion in, involved and so this is a little bit of like a reminder but don't forget just bring up a map type in the um the, the silk road into Google, look at that map and look at the existing railway network that runs through Russia. China cannot operate without Russia. Like it cannot. And never mind the fact that there's an economic belt that's going to run through through um, inland transportation infrastructure. Guess what? Through Ukraine <laughs> into the proposed rail pipeline um, railways that are going to come south of Ukraine, um, coming up then into Western Europe. So well, that, I mean, how, that's their problem. I mean, they can't they can't side with Russia because that will annoy Ukraine, though, right? But they can't side with Ukraine because that will annoy Russia. So I guess I guess you're right in that they've got to stay neutral-ish. But today they have they have moved off the neutral fence. That's just to keep moved Putin. slightly just, in favour of that's Ukraine. That's just to remind Putin, I think. Yeah, in my opinion that look, just <laughs> a reminder here because it was when the Winter Olympics. Um, started i think that's when putin was in china yeah. and they signed like a big accord about we i can't remember the exact phrase that they said it was something very um very clear like we will do there's no there's no exception to how far our relationship will go i think that's what they said in a joint communique and here we are and china have apparently turned a little bit <laughs> what's what's your view on the taiwan risk then I, well, I heard what you said last week, and I, I totally agree. I think the risk 
assessment is radically different in terms of the risk reward of that move. I just think ta Taiwan, um, but the sovereignty, the nature of the sovereignty of that island is more an ideology of this one China view rather yeah. than a strategic move, say, for the transportation of or the infrastructure of right. oil and gas. Yeah, yeah. So it's different now. And, and then you throw in the whole, um, like you said, like what is the sixth largest semiconductor producer in the world. So China know that and they know that trade with the US is still integral to their own economy. So I, I don't see that as a thing. But do, what about this hypothesis? Xi Jinping waits till November when you get the once every five years party congress and he's going to be anointed as the permanent king of China or whatever you want to call it, right? And I think getting past that hurdle is absolutely, that's all he cares about. Once past that hurdle, does that, does he feel like that's his endorsement to then set about those kind of agendas of bringing Taiwan back into the fold? Or do you just think, actually, we've miscalculated this and, and that's, that's not going to happen? I, I think Taiwan, and I think Ukraine, I think these are much more long-term ambitions. I definitely don't think that what's happened in Ukraine right now, although the timing and the aggressiveness, as I said, of the, the, the invasion that's happened now was, was slightly surprised. The fact that Russia are trying to take sovereignty from Ukraine is not new. And this war has been ongoing nonstop since 2014. It's just not in a physical form. It's been happening in a cyber form. Yeah. And so I don't think that, um, well, whatever happens with this Russian situation is too hard to tell right now in the short term. In the long term, though, I do think that it will end up being the case of these countries will gradually take sovereignty of these areas. They both, both know, Russia, I think, and China in the way in which their political system is structured, that they've got time. And so what's happened here, I think, is an overt kind of step forward in aggression. But ultimately, I think probably the best case scenario here is that Putin gets what he wants, which is eastern part of Ukraine. And then it just slightly more goes the way of Russia. But I'd probably say we'll be here again in another 10 years and he'll take another yeah. slice. And I think with Taiwan, it's just the same over a protractedly long period, just given the yeah. fact that she is not in any rush at all. So, and all the meanwhile, economically, I know let's ignore the short term deceleration in China that we're seeing right now. But the demographic change and shift economically is it's all heading that way anyway. And I just think it's just why I mean, this is why I was surprised a lot with Putin. And I think with China, I think they do try to go about it. Well, you've seen it. They're changing the way of which they deal with issues on climate change, on all these different types of things. China has tried to modernize to a certain respect on the international scene. This, this kind of riding shirtless on the back of a bear, like Putin style. I mean, you don't see Xi doing that. Um, so I think, I think the, yeah, I think it will be a much more long, long, long way out until we got to see Taiwan. I definitely, to ask your question, this is not going to lead like, right, end of the year, they go gun ho in, we're taking Taiwan. That's not going to happen, I don't think. But I was wrong with Russia, with what just happened now. So yeah, that's what I think. Okay. Uh, but look, away from this, then, what this is resulting in is we've talked about energy, we've talked about soft, talk about base metals, zinc, higher since 07, aluminium record high. So what we've got here at the moment is inflation on an annualized basis in the US is 7.5%. It's a four decade high. Now you've got this. We already knew it was going to go above the 7.5% anyway. I mean, in the UK now, we're talking what... Uh, I can't keep up with the latest forecast now. We're eight, nine percent. We're talking now. Um, so, what what does this mean going further forward? Because does this start to tilt us into dangerous territory now? As far as what happens beyond what we can see, which is then they start hiking rates aggressively. 
to tackle inflation, what does this mean for the probability of recession risk going forward? Yeah, and I think, well, for sure, this this Ukraine Russia geopolitical situation with the secondary knock on impact to drive broad commodity price spikes then has a tertiary impact of meaning inflation is going to stay higher for longer, which means central banks then are, well, I've got an even more difficult challenge to try and deal with it. But the problem you have probably in 2022 is that ultimately is, I guess, into the end of last year and the start of this year, what you had was a rebound economically as economies reopened after, let's say, Omicron or, you know. And so that real strong economic kind of engine was firing. And so central banks can hike rates quickly, although markets don't like it. Central banks can hike rates quickly to try and contain high inflation and get away with it if the economy is really strong. I think the worry here is now that this situation is going to last for longer and so long that actually that COVID opening up rebound is going to slow and then you're left with still really high inflation and economies that are losing momentum. This is what we call then stagflation risk. It's the kind of worst case scenario where you've got inflation too high and economic growth too low. Because the central bank to tackle that high inflation, well, you hike rates, but that puts a break on consumption. It's a negative for growth. So if growth is already dangerously weak and you're hiking to contain inflation, then that's where you get a recession. And, and you know, with these commodities, everyone's talking and they're right. The only way these commodities come back down in the near term, and certainly when you think about things like oil, is if demand just collapses. Because at the moment, all the whole supply side spectrum is just positive for price, everything. And it's not just short term with Russia and so on. It's, you know, you've had, you know, stuff like what's gone on this week's insane with BP who own 20% of Rosneft have said, right, we're binning it. We're out. We're divesting out of Russia. Shell own a huge chunk of Gazprom. We're out. Everyone's out. Exxon Mobil this week, again, or today, sorry, we're out as well. Everyone's divesting. And Russia's a hugely important strategic location for, you know, discovery of more kind of resources that can be pulled out of the ground and more supply, right? And the infrastructure being invested in. And this whole infrastructure investment to increase production, of course, the green wave has meant that the investment going into that has been collapsing anyway. And now you're getting these big energy giants pulling out of Russia, and it just makes the supply situation meet short, medium, and long-term supply situation now is looking really weak, Okay, which is very positive for price. So the only way price can come back down for stuff like oil is if demand collapses. That will only happen if this whole scenario drives a really sharp global recession. And I think at the moment that won't happen. You won't get a sharp global recession. I think you might get a milder inflation-driven, you know, higher rates recession. So mild recession, which will maybe obviously dent demand, but not to the point where oil is going to go back to, I don't know, $60, $70. You know, I, I honestly think that Will we ever see oil? Here's a, here's a statement. Will we ever see oil trade back below $90 ever again? Cool. I'm not sure we will. I've got my uh, title for the podcast episode now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure we will. Okay. Well, look, on the demand side, that's, not going to help either. The Wall Street Journal were reporting last night that China is considering dropping its zero tolerance to COVID policy. Oh, right. I missed that. Is that right? So Beijing is unlikely unlikely to do this until next spring. But apparently the report was suggesting they're going, to, ex- spring. They, they're going to experiment with measures in certain cities. It's insane. So, so last really? night, 
um, travel, leisure, all the Macau related gaming stocks, they all soared near double digit percent last last night right. um, in China. So yeah, that could be a... An but hang on, this isn't going to start for another 12 months. Right. We're talking I mean, China here, Piers, come on. It's, it's, just, it's just crazy. It's crazy policy. My friend's yeah. currently in the Hong Kong um, hotel for the uninfected. Yeah, it's bad. That's actually what it's called. Right yeah, the hotel for the uninfected. Uh, he's <laughs> And you've got to be there for three weeks as you enter into the country. Um, three weeks quarantining on entry, even if you, if you don't have it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was supposed to go to see my um, my grand my granddad actually um, later this year. He turns a hundred. Oh wow! But I don't think we're going to be able to go. To be honest, not, not at this rate. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> the golden peach, they call it in China. What turning a hundred? <laughs> yeah, you have to give you have to I have to give him a, a, a basically a gold peach. It's <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's in like a little glass box, pair of peaches. <laughs> I like it. Um, here, all you get here is you get a letter from the Queen, right? Right, which is, yeah, Apparently. a nice touch, but it's not gold. No. <laughs> yeah, and gold's pretty pricey right now, so... Absolutely. <laughs> so the other thing then here is that we had the semi-annual testimony, and in any other normal time, this would be the major talking point that you and I would be discussing right now. This is kind of like the platform where Powell sets out the stall of policy and latest uh, monetary policy thinking. But obviously, it's being dominated by, as we discussed, Russia. But Powell said on that point, they'll need to proceed carefully, emphasizing the need to be nimble to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Importantly, though, he said that he's inclined to back a quarter basis point hike. So he, he explicitly said that. So 50, it's gone. Yeah. Um, and the other second important point he said was before you get too hasty flipping in the other direction, thinking, oh, okay, let's just price all the hikes off because of what's happening. He did say, we are open to a series of rate hikes. And the market pricing, last time I checked a few hours ago, is five. We've priced in for five now. I think we got as much as seven before, which is the, yeah. full, the full sweep of the year of 22. But it's come back a little bit. Any thoughts on, on Powell I on those numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think the Fed have to hike and it's got to be the start of a cycle. And for me, it's just the speed of the hiking cycle. That's the only variable. I don't, you know, unless there's a big recession, which there might be, in which case, fine, they might have to revise things. But right now for the next, for 2022, it is the speed of the hiking cycle that's the only variable. And I mean, look, I, I was never, ever anywhere near the seven rate hikes prediction. I thought that was insane. Even though the likes of Goldman's and I think JP Morgan was it were kind of, and the whole market was kind of got a bit carried away in pricing in seven. And I think Powell's used that. He, he kind of, he almost had 50 in the bank, right? He had a 50 hike. He had a March 50 hike in the bank, right? And so what I mean by that is markets had already priced it in. So Markets wouldn't have freaked out any more than they'd already had done if it have hiked 50. So it's actually quite a nice luxury to go, well, actually, you know what? I'm, we're going to hike by less. So the whole mindset from a market's point of view is then, all right, great. It's less, it's less rate hikes than we thought. So it's a positive. But they're still hiking. And look, they need to because, you know, this inflation thing's out of hand. So whether it's five... I don't know. I'm still a four. I'm a, I'm a four hike man once a quarter. Okay. Well, look, let's, let's end it there for Russia. Let's just do our final part where, just to change it up, we thought we'd have a quick chat about TikTok because I know probably the majority of people listening are on and use TikTok on a daily basis, it would seem, because I'm going to run through a few stats here before we talk about why we're talking TikTok. So here's TikTok by the numbers. Active users. 1 billion. That's 1 billion monthly active users. Market penetration. There are 4.8 billion internet users. 20.83% use 
ByteDance's video sharing services. TikTok has now surpassed Twitter, Telegram, Reddit, Pinterest, Snapchat in monthly users. TikTok is the most engaging social media app. The average session length is 10 minutes, nearly 11 minutes. That blows my mind because I remember when Facebook was first monetizing its platform, which wasn't that long ago, yeah. a couple of years, right? When they IPO, then it was like, oh, how are they going to monetize these users? And it was like- well, more than a couple of years. Hang on, hang on. It's like 2014, 2015, Facebook IPO. Okay, perhaps I'm showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like a few years ago. But the, the point being there is that I remember the conversations are pivoting around like minute, two minutes, it's yeah. only 11 minutes here. I mean, that's insane. And then to, to look at this globally, the average time spent on TikTok per day, so over the day, is 52 minutes, which just blew my mind when I read that, with 90% of users accessing it on a daily basis. Um, TikTok's Generation Z penetration, the highest in America of all places, 47.4% of their active users are aged between check out the bottom end of this range, 10 yeah. to 29. And I saw this at Christmas, actually. My um, brother-in-law, his daughter, who is seven, she was like a zombie. She was like zonked. I mean, I get it. Like Christmas gets boring, right? You sat around <laughs> eating, watching rubbish TV. But it was like it was like something had become her and she would just sit there with the phone in her face, like hiding in the sofa. Well, for an incredibly long it's cra- time. like because yeah, in America, it's 120 million users in America. So okay. we, I was just looking at the demographic kind of age splits, and because you like naturally, I say someone who's in their 40s, right? So I've got a daughter who's 15, so she's like spot on, bang in the 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 kind of at least the, like well, hang on, the lower end of the definite age range. And she's obviously on it and all her friends are on it all of the time. You know, you mentioned 52 minutes a day there. I am absolutely not surprised. I'm surprised it's not more looking at the usage that I see with my own eyes. But um, in America, so between uh, the population between the ages of 15 and 34, which you think that's going to be most, it's 80 million people. Okay, aged between 15 and 34, 80 million. But there's 120 million US users. So, yeah, there's got to be people below 15 and below 10. And I I mean, on the upper, going above 35, I guess so. I mean, I'm in my 40s and I don't use it. My None of my friends use it. I don't know if that's unusual. Do you you use it? No. You're basically in your 40s now, right? (laughs) Almost. (laughs) <laughs> um no none of my friends use it yeah like so, so we're in our like late 30s yeah so look that's a lot of usage going on um in america but that, that, what was interesting yeah the top do you know the top usage so it's america's number one 120 million then it's indonesia 87 and a half million active users then it's brazil 73 million russia next at 549 million mexico 42. The UK, it's actually down on in 10th place. Obviously, our population is not as big as the likes of the US and the Indonesians and the Brazils, but um, yeah, 10th place, 20 million users here in the UK. Yeah, and so the reason why we're, we're talking about TikTok in such a way is that eight states, including California, Massachusetts in the US, announced midweek that they've launched a bipartisan nationwide probe of TikTok, uh, focusing on whether... Uh, the app causes any physical or mental harm to young people and uh, that will probably resonate because of the fact that it was a similar thing that they were going after with facebook and instagram this was just prior to the pivot to a meta platform um, that we had at the time amongst a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that were facebook were facing at the time so yeah i mean what it's been banned in india that was a huge market for them um, I guess a lot of this is coming out of what data privacy concerns the idea that this is a Chinese owned app. Yeah, I mean, in India, that's true. India was the biggest, you're right, but they banned it because of data privacy concerns. Other countries have banned it for other reasons, um, like Pakistan have banned it for immoral and indecent content. 
for example. But um, yeah, I mean, look, you, we, we've had some, you know, certainly the data privacy and the Chinese situation in, in the US has been aired. But I think this is this seems to be different. This seems to be very squarely about mental health. And I know firsthand, again, as a parent of a child who uses TikTok, and look, I don't want to just pigeonhole TikTok here, just the general social media, you know, Snapchat. Basically, my daughter uses TikTok and Snapchat. Um, not so much Instagram, but definitely not Facebook. Um, but, you know, that, that, these kind of, this online world, right? It's like, like, it's like the, the, the pre-meta sort of online world um, it carries great benefits, don't get me wrong, in terms of connectivity, but also I think carries huge challenges for particularly young people. And I see it firsthand. I think what this is from the US point of view, personally, I think this move, these noises about flagging the mental health situation, I think is squarely aimed at parents in the US ahead of the midterms. Um, and I think this is Biden trying to play a card here to up his ratings and win a few votes by saying, look, we're aware of the mental health issues. We know you're aware of them. We know you're concerned about them. And we've, we're on it. We're, we're going to do something about it. And I think that and I think this is a political maneuver to try and engineer a bit more support amongst the parent demographic in America. Now, is it going to actually go anywhere? Is, does it mean anything for usage of TikTok in America? Definitely not in the short term. Absolutely not. Medium term, probably not. We're probably, you know, America's been going after the, the Facebooks of this world for years, right, in terms of regulatory risk and threats, and, and, and obviously nothing yet has happened. And so I think this is, falls into that category. Yeah, and with... Uh, the kind of other angle that complements that, I think, in a way of the optics from Biden's administration's point of view, uh, is, is kind of talking about the um, just the nature of um, just trying to think how 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 to put it. So it's like with inflation going higher at the moment, people are going to get poorer because wages are not going to keep pace. And so all this meantime, we've seen large corporations get larger and larger and larger. And so you just want to, to appear to be siding with the average Joe to be doing what you can to go out of your way, protect their children, as you said, but also to have a fair playing field that's not being penalized by big corporate America. Nothing will change. Like you said, it's just strategy to to position yourself accordingly to pick up a certain pocket of what might register with one of the many different variables that voters look at when they're making their decision. So, yeah, I think that's a interesting take and I, I'd say I would agree with you. Biden needs it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, as I said, Go back and um, feel free to check out some of the career insights um, that we've put out the last couple of weeks. There's three, actually. We've done one with a portfolio manager. gives a really good insight into that as a role because I know that's one where I guess there's a bit of mystique around that. It's kind of like, how do you actually become a PM? Because a lot of people think that sounds pretty cool, like managing billions of dollars, but how do you actually get to that point? What are the stresses when you're there? What are the skills needed for it? There's one on that. There's one from a former trainee of ours, uh, Ayman Rahman from 10, well, 11 years ago, who yep. now runs one of the biggest players in the energy market based here in London. Um, and he did a session uh, with me, which was really great, gave uh, five top tips that he'd give to any finance student about what helped him at least have, have success for himself. And then the last one I mentioned with Bill Al. So yeah, go and check those out if you're a student listening. Otherwise, that's it for this week. Uh, good to be back. Thanks for, for the hour, yeah. Piers, as ever. Can you, can you not go away from the desk ever again? <laughs> or some people might say, can you go on holiday again? <laughs> Depends what, what you want the market to do, basically. I'm going to check that passport for any yeah, kind that, of that UK that, or that Russia that long stamps. Looking. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, Piers, and uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend.